Good morning and welcome to today's episode of WTVA Distance Learning brought to you by the New Albany School District. My name is Luke Tintoni and I have the honor and privilege of being the assistant principal at New Albany High School. Today's episode has three different segments. First, Mr. Glenn Reeder from the New Albany Elementary School will have some tips on crafts. Next, Mr. Robert Garrett will have tips for all your technology devices as it pertains to cloud storage. And then finally, you'll see an osmosis science lab performed by Ms. Summer Tyre, Ms. Mary Scott Sanks, and Ms. Katie Kent from New Albany High School. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning. I'm Glenn Reeder and I work at the New Albany Elementary School. I teach second and third grade gifted, which we call Excel in our school. I'm going to be sharing with you today a do-it-yourself project. This could be a Mother's Day event or any project. We've done it for Christmas. We've done it for all occasions. But that's what we're going to be doing this morning. So I'm going to demonstrate and kind of show you how to do it. These are the items that you would need for your project. You would need wood pieces and that could be anything lying around your house with a good, flat, smooth surface. If it's not smooth, you'll want to uh, sand that off just a bit. You'll also need some nails. I suggest one inch roofing nails because of the large head that's on them. But you can also use any type of nail as long as it has a good head so that you can wrap your yarn around there. Speaking of yarn, you're going to need yarn and it could be any color that you have around the house. Go look at mom's drawer, go look in the cabinet, wherever, and find that yarn. Choose the color that you would like or maybe purchase some so that you can use it. And the pattern that you want to use. Create your own pattern, which would be really cool. I've given the, the pattern of a flower that we're going to be using today, but we've used a cross. And some of these uh, you will see in these slides, we have the cross pattern right there. It even has step-by-step uh, -step directions on how to do it. You'll put the piece of paper down there, uh, tack your nails in, make holes. And so that's uh, easily doable and easy to follow. The cross is probably the most simple one that we have. We've also created some Christmas ones, and that's the Christmas tree and a porn set of flower. We've also done a star, as you can see there on those patterns. And then the one that we'll be doing today is the summer flower aka the poinsettia I guess you might say but you'll just change your colors and make it the color that you want it to be now mine was a little tight or a little tight that we're going to be using today you may want to expand yours and make it larger these can be expanded that's why I say create your own pattern these are all things that you probably have lying around your house so that's what's going to make this really easy today what we're going to be doing is we're going to make a flower for Mother's Day as you can see though we have done some in the past at Christmas we had Christmas trees we did uh, poinsettia we have done a star as well at Christmas doing those sort of things. It is yarn and nails. We have also created the cross. The cross is probably the most simple that you could create. So for the smaller ones that are watching today, this might be an easier thing because all moms like crosses too uh, and dads as well. So that might be what you want to do. You will want to start with a piece of wood. Now, I collected all these pieces of wood right out of my shed. As you can see, they're not perfect. And that's what makes them kind of cool. Um, these are from actual old shed that we had that we tore down. And it's very hard wood, kind of hard to hammer into, but it's very unique uh, design and really cool. But any size, this is a great little size, perfect little size. It's been uh, sanded down. So you might want to sand it if it has rough edges so that it looks nice. I like the thicker chunks of wood. This was actually off of our porch at home. Uh, and so it's real thick and solid. It sits up when you want it to. So that's why I would choose that. So this morning we chose this one. And as you notice, it's a little lopsided. Well, when you start hammering, sometimes you break the wood and that's what happened. But we just revamp, turn it over and start again. I'm going to start this morning by showing you I use these nails right here. And this is a one inch uh, roofing nail. And the reason I use this is because of the large heads, especially for our smaller students who are trying to get the yarn around the uh, nail head. You can use any type of nail, but you need a good wide head so that it works. And so that's just what I choose to use is the roofing nail. Now I've already completed the center as you can see right here. I've taken the yarn and wound it around. This is the center of our flower. And now what we're going to do is we're going to tie this and I've tied this one in a knot already to one nail. So you will tie it onto the nail and then you just start making the outline of your design. And what you're going to do is you're going to come into the inside. You're going to go around the outside. I'm making the petals of the flower as you can see. And then we're going to come by and catch the, the uh, nails on the inside. Here we go, like this right here. Okay, and I'm going to go back and we're going to catch the outside of this one. And this kind of intricate, but it, it, it's a little aggravating. There are some words in my classroom that we do not use, and those words are, I can't, and this is too hard, Mr. Glenn. Whoop, and Mr. Glenn's got to hold up just a minute. That's the thing we've got to do. I've got to add a couple of nails. So you just want to use a little tack. There you go. And we've got a couple of more nails that we need right here. And I have the pattern. I've dotted it. You can dot it with a magic marker, or you can actually 
attack the nails right in there like I'm doing right there. It's very easy, very simple. Now, I will say this, parents. You may want to help the smaller students with the hammer. <laughs> we had to learn in the second grade how to use the hammer and use it correctly so we didn't uh, end up going to the nurse's office with a lot of smashed thumb. So you've got to be very careful with that sort of thing. So you may want to have some adult supervision when you're working with this with your students. Now, mom and dad can help or if you want to do it as a gift, as I'm talking about for Mother's Day, because that is just around the corner, uh, this would be a really cool little Mother's Day happy um, set on. It'll set in the windowsill, can sit on the desk at work. So it's really kind of cool. Now, as you can see, the, the flower is coming more into focus. And there we go. Now, the next thing, let's just say what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and tie this one off real quick. So when you tie it off, you just want to tie so that you can, uh, if you don't, you'll have loose ends of yarn and you don't want that to happen. So I'm just going to clip that one right there. And there we go. Now, what you're going to want to do now is you're going to want to press this down and you keep pushing it down because you'll, you'll notice as we look at this one right here, I'll show you the thickness of this one. We kept pressing it down and you've got layers and layers of yarn. You can change colors of yarn. And I chose the orange and the yellow because of the flowers of the season. So that's, that's kind of the, the reason we went with that design. But as you can see, you can, you can sort of see the flower now, but as you press it down and you keep adding layers and more layers and more layers, and it's kind of tough. Like I say, that word that we don't use in my classroom, this is too hard. You just say, this is a little difficult. Maybe get an adult to help you press this down and push it down and keep adding layer after layer after layer. As you add the layers, it becomes very thick and your design can become quite intricate. The cross, I'm going to move over to the cross for a second. It's very easy. Now this cross, if you'll notice, is just an outlined cross. That's one way some students like to do it. It's you tie it to a, one of your nails and you just start doing the outline and you go around the outline and you just keep pressing down and pressing down and pressing down. What's really cool, now for instance, I know one of my students last year took and they looked at the colors and they were like, well, I don't, I like the tan, but they decided to use the maroon. The maroon looked really cool with the tan. Just, I didn't think it would, but it did. They took the maroon and did an intricate design on the inside of the cross, which made the cross really pop and made it look totally different. So there are a lot of options, a lot of different ways that you can do this. Now, this is a lot of fun, boys and girls. And this is something that you could do, like I say, as a family, um, you could do it individually. Uh, parents, you may want to get them started. Started. You may want to print them out a pattern. Create your own pattern. Um, and on that thought, uh, my son, when he was in college, he had done these in youth group with us, but he decided to take it upon himself and to go one step further. So he created, he, of course, he's a Mississippi State fan um, and, and attended Mississippi uh, State, but he did the Hell State where you can see the same kind of roofing tax, and he, he's very, very thickly done with, you know, he just kept adding and adding and adding and pressing and pressing and really makes a statement being so bold and uh, so thick. So this is really cool. This is definitely a step up, but that's the challenge. Challenge. Boys and girls, we're out of school. We've got a lot of time on our hands. So have some fun. Decide how you can do this. Decide what project you want to do and uh, decide what design you want to do. As he did, he spelled out words. Pretty cool to do that. So if you've got a piece of wood that's a large plank, hey, be creative and have fun with it. But certainly get permission before you go start uh, nailing into dad's wood so we don't get in trouble. Um, but I want you to have fun with this. Uh, it's a little different. I know we're doing a lot of uh, different things in school and our school is looking totally different these days, but this is a little fun, a little activity, creation station as we call it in my classroom. So boys and girls and parents, I hope you have fun making this project. Have a great day. Hey, welcome to today's technology tip. So on today's technology tip, I'm going to explain to you what cloud storage is. I'm going to explain Google Drive and iCloud and why you need them, why they're important, right? So Google Drive and iCloud, what happened is Google and Apple set up server farms all over the United States. And when I say a server farm, picture a building full of computers. And whenever you take a picture on your iPhone, if you're using iCloud, they store that image in their server farm so you never lose it, right? So, I mean, you may have a child, say they're five years old, and you're taking pictures of them. And in 10 years, you want to still have those images. And so the way that Google Drive and iCloud work is you have your phone, you have your iPad, or you have your computer. Well, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, if you took that image on your phone, it was stored only on your phone. And you might drop your phone into a puddle and ruin it. Or drop, say you go boating, you go to Pickwick and you go boating, 
and you drop your phone into the water and you lose it forever. Well, that image would be lost forever as well. And so what Google Drive and what iCloud have done is what they call the cloud, right? It's not really a cloud. What it is is server farms all over the United States and it leverages the internet speeds. So when you take that picture, if you're paying for Google Drive or iCloud, it stores that image on their, on their computers so that you don't have to have it on your phone all the time, right? So let me walk you through the pricing of Google Drive and iCloud. So here I am on Google Drive, and you can see that it allows you to store files, it allows you to store images, it allows you to store videos. You can see it from any device. You can see it from your phone, your tablet, or your computer. You can share it with anybody, which is awesome. All right, so now let's look at pricing. So the way Google does their pricing is they have some tiers. So the tier that most people would be interested in is two terabits of storage for $99 a year, which is very cheap. Now, I think they do a monthly plan that costs $10 a month, but this is an extremely good deal, right? So if you were to sign up for storage with Google Drive and store all your images from your phone, your iPad, or your computer, two terabits is plenty of space for most people, right? Power users may not need it, but most people, two terabits is gonna, do, is gonna, is gonna be plenty for you. Right, And that pricing, $99 a year or $9.99 a month, is a great price. It gives you peace of mind. You take a picture and in 10 years, you know you will not lose that photo. Right? Let me show you iCloud's pricing. So iCloud is a little bit different the way they price it in the United States. So what they do is they say, okay, we're going to give you 50 gigs of storage for $0.99 cents per month. 50 gigs of storage is a good amount of storage, and for 99 cents, it's a bargain. I mean, think about it. You lose 99 cents in the floorboard of your car per month. So that's a, I see a lot of people who come to me and they ask, you know, Google, I mean, Apple is saying on my phone, my iPhone, that I need more iCloud storage. Are they just trying to get my money? And what Apple's doing there is they're trying to protect you. They don't want you to lose your contacts. They don't want you to lose your photos. They don't want you to lose your videos. And so they built iCloud storage in there and 50 gigs a month, I mean 50 gigs for 99 cents a month is kind of their lowest plan that allows you to save your contacts, save your photos. It's a bargain, right? Now their next pricing structure is 200 gigs for $3 a month and then two terabits for $10 a month. What I would tell you is every one of these pricing plans is a bargain. And the more content you have, the more storage you need, okay? So 50 gigs is 99 cents. Well, 1,000 gigs is one terabit. So when they have two terabits, what they're saying to you there is you can get 2,000 gigs for $10 a month. So what I would encourage you to do is have a storage plan for all your data. How are you gonna keep important documents? How are you gonna keep important pictures? What's your plan for if you drop your phone into a lake, are you gonna lose everything that's on it or are you gonna have it backed up into the cloud? The cloud is safe and Apple and Google spend tons of money to keep it secure. So I hope that helps. Thanks for joining me and we'll see you next time. Hey, good morning. I'm Katie Kent. I'm Mary Sanks. And I'm Summer Tyre and we team teach biology at New Albany High School. Today we're gonna to focus on a standard that our students really, really struggle on so you guys um, I think you'll like this one. It is osmosis, and we're going to look at the movement of water in gummy bears. So what I want to start out with, when we tackle this standard, and this standard kind of, like, shout out to the biology teachers, this standard kind of scares us when we approach it because our students always tend to struggle with it. So we're going to try to make it clear so that you guys know all about osmosis and what it is. So when we start this, the first thing we do is is look at vocabulary. So with, with osmosis, if you have a good understanding of the vocabulary, then you're in a better shape to understand the problems that you may see with it and the process. So what I want you to think about right now is being really thirsty. So you're really, really thirsty and you want to go in the kitchen and you want to make some lemonade or some Kool-Aid. All right. So when you go to the kitchen and you make your lemonade or Kool-Aid, first you have to start with a solvent. So you're going to go get your pitcher and you're going to fill it up with a solvent. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I make Kool-Aid at home, I use water. Water is the universal solvent. 
All right, so when we think about osmosis, we're gonna think about the solid water because osmosis is the diffusion of water from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And that's gonna make more sense in just a little bit. All right, so I'm making my Kool-Aid. I've got my solvent, which is the water, and then I'm going to add in Kool-Aid. Now, I can't fill my bucket or my pitcher all the way full of water and then expect to have room to put my Kool-Aid powder in there. I've got to save some room for my Kool-Aid powder. So the first thing I do is fill up with some water to a certain level. All right, so that is all water. That's my concentration of water. Then I'm going to add my Kool-Aid powder. So we all know that in order to have a complete percentage, a complete percentage is 100%. So when we think about complete, we're thinking about the solution. And the solution is Kool-Aid. It's the water and the Kool-Aid powder mixed, which equals out our drink, our drink of Kool-Aid. So we're looking for 100%. So we may have 80% water, 20% Kool-Aid powder, and the 100% is the solution once it's mixed together. So as we look at our lab and we work through some problems, one thing that I want you guys to really, really, really think about is we are moving water. <laughs> Osmosis is the movement of water. It may be termed different when we look at the problems. You may see it called osmotic pressure. You may see them say, does the solute move? The solute does not move, the water moves. Water is able to go through that semi-permeable membrane and remember semi-permeable means that some things can get through while others cannot so water is going to move through that membrane salt or kool-aid powder or whatever your solute is may not be able to move through that membrane osmosis is the water moving so now that i've established some vocabulary we're going to look at a lab that we do in our classroom when we cover this topic Okay, so to dig a little bit deeper into the process of osmosis, we do something called the gummy bear lab. And so the guiding question for this lab is, what will different type of liquids do to the size of a gummy bear? Now, very important, when we talk about gummy bears, we're using this to represent our cells and our bodies because this is all um, types of cellular transport. So, if you're at home, what you'll need is three cups. I'm using beakers, but any type of cups will do. Um, you'll need gummy bears, salt. If balance is optional, um, we're, I'm going to show you how you can use it with the balance and without the balance. And then any liquid of choice. So, what I'm going to do today, in an experiment, you always need constant. So, I have my water here. I made sure they're the same exact level. So, you want to measure everything out. Um, so I have my tap water and then salt water. This is actually just water right now, so I need to add some salt. Another thing you could do is add sugar. That would have the same effect if you did sugar, water. And then I'm going to have some vinegar. So this is my liquid of choice. You could literally do anything that's in your fridge. You could use Coke, milk, whatever you want to use. So I'm going to try to get this as even as possible. Okay. If, you, if you don't have a scale and you want to measure the size, like, trace them out. Mm -hmm. Trace out the size of your gummy bear. That would be a way to differentiate yes. the size. Mm -hmm. Also, another way, I have one extra gummy bear that I'm leaving here for comparison when I pull my um, gummy bears out. But while we're sitting here, I just want to ask the question. I'll ask you all too. Um, which one of these three do you think has the higher concentration of water? you got tap water, salt water, or vinegar. Okay, so I'm going to think about it like this. If I, I love ice. Like, I like a little drink with my ice. So if I go to Sonic and I order a sweet tea, my husband says I'm wasting money because when I order a large sweet tea, I say I want extra ice. Well, why would I be wasting money? Because he has the same size cup as I have. We both ordered sweet tea. I just ordered extra ice. So we should have the same amount of tea, right, Miss Kent? Right, but... But I do not because the ice is taking up room in my cup. So when Miss Saints added salt to this water, it took up room in her cup. So now she has less water concentration because she's moved in the salt. Okay. And another way to think about it, and Miss Tyre touched on this a second ago, but this is like 
really, I mean, it's a good way to think about it. If you fill a glass uh, or a, a pitcher up with water all the way to the brim, and then you try to put your Kool-Aid mix in with that water and, and you've already filled it up to the top, it's going to overflow. And that's what we're trying to get you guys to think about is that the concentration of water, you've got your concentration of water, then you have your concentration of your solid or whatever you add. Okay, so think of them as two separate things and together, like Ms. Tyre said, they're gonna equal up to 100%. Okay, so those are good things to think about. So what we're gonna do, we have our three glasses. You're gonna put one gummy bear in each. This is after you've documented, either drawn the size of the gummy bear, weighed it, or you have your um, extra gummy bear for comparison. So you're gonna drop one in the top water, one in the salt water, and then I have vinegar, whichever liquid you chose. Um, this is the waiting game. You have to wait at least 24 hours before you check on your gummy bear. Um, because of time, I've gone ahead and done one if you'll get me um, that one. So this is after 24 hours what happened to the gummy bear. So if you look, it looks like it got a lot bigger. So the question is, is why the, did the gummy bear get bigger? Well, like they said, this was put in tap water. So tap water is going to have the higher water concentration. So the water is going into the gummy bear. Okay, so that's why the gummy bear got bigger. Think if you were playing with the water balloon. You have the balloon. If you start putting water in it, the balloon's going to get bigger and bigger until it might even bust. So that is why the gummy bear has gotten so big. Water has traveled into the bear. Um, salt water, I want y'all to have the surprise of seeing what it looks like, but think about um, the salt water. This is a hypertonic solution, so you're going to have less water on the outside, so more than likely your gummy bear, is water is going to leave it and it's going to shrink. I forgot to mention tap water, this is a hypotonic solution. I like to call it hippo tonics because hippos are big, so you can remember that's why the gummy bear got big like a hippo. And then you have your liquid of choice. So y'all get to be the scientists there and decide if this is a hypertonic solution or a hypotonic solution. Spiro is an app-enabled robot that is programmed through an app that students are able to download on their iPad. Um, through that robot, they're able to learn aspects of coding. Uh, the reason that we use Spiro in our classroom is to provide the students with a hands-on, really engaging environment so that they're able to actively apply the coding and computer science concepts that they're learning about in class. Coding is the act of just writing instructions in a way that a computer is able to carry them out. So the way that students do that, um, they're able to do it first through block programming. So there are specific blocks that they can use and those blocks they're able to put in certain actions that the computer will carry out. And that's called an algorithm when the students are able to write specific steps for their computer program to carry out. Um, the other thing that the students are able to do is they're able to actually write what those blocks create, which is called a JavaScript. And that gets a little more complicated. So we start out with the block coding so that the students have a really good solid foundation as they move on through computer science and coding. What we're doing when we learn the coding and we're learning the process of telling a computer what to do, you know, a computer is not just the desktop that you use in your office. A computer is any device that is able to store and process data. And um, so for our classroom purposes, we're using the Sphero robot. Um, but take a real world example of a person who's working at Toyota. They are working with very large scale robots. Those robots do anything from taking a whole door and putting it onto a car, or they're doing something as simple as just screwing in a screw. Um, so every action that that robot completes, it doesn't just know how to do that automatically. There's a person behind the scenes who is 
inserting that information and that is our coding. Whenever they're typing the instructions, um, they are telling that robot, which is programmed through a computer, they're telling it what to do. So our students are learning information that is really going to set them apart in the real world once they are outside of the school environment. In our district at the elementary level, we do teach coding. Um, so the students are learning how to write code and what code is, but when they move to the middle school, they're learning through the robots that that code actually does something within a real world context. Last week I was given the opportunity where I was able to go to a local Kiwanis meeting and I took three students with me who were able to demonstrate to some members in our community who are education supporters, how we actually use that Sphero in the classroom. The response that we received from the Kiwanis meeting was really positive and the adults who maybe did not really understand what coding and computer science fully entailed, by the end of the meeting they had a good grasp and they even were really excited and wanted to see the Spheros in person. I knew a little bit about Sphero because my son has a different version that's called an Ollie, um, but I really wasn't aware of the educational uses for Sphero, um, but Mr. Garrett from the central office uh, had mentioned them to me, so I went and I looked them up and did some really solid research and found that they're an excellent way for the students to have that hands-on engagement in order to see what coding really does and how it interacts with a computer program. We use the Spheros in our classroom not only for coding and computer science, but we also use it in order to integrate um, the core content subjects that the students are learning. So for example, they can use the Spheros to learn math concepts such as angles, and they can learn velocity and acceleration. They're learning to map out area and volume by using their Spheros. Um, they're also able to use it in really unconventional ways for things such as English. They can write a story or read a story and they can actually program that robot to act out that story. They can program it to say things, to light up in different colors, to even make noises or animal sounds. It's just something that brings total engagement and we're able to integrate all of the content that maybe some students aren't so excited about learning and provide um, a, an outlet for them to really be passionate for those subjects. Thanks for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed the lessons brought to you by the faculty of the New Albany School District. Be sure and visit our website at www.nasd.ms. And to all my students at New Albany High School, remember, if nobody's told you they love you today, you better know that I do. It's a great day to be a Bulldog. <laughs>